I'd like to go back to three topics. To just add the fourth one with fiscal policy, but um, let's start with the three uh, before opening the floor. The first is this issue of the competitiveness wage price adjustment. I mean, you all three agree on the diagnosis. That this part of the functioning of the euro area is not satisfactory. Um, Was not. Sorry? Was not. What, I mean, the, yes, some adjustments took place, but not. the adjustment is still, it's perhaps faster than some would have expected. I mean, Ireland had adjusted you know, extremely well. Uh, even Greece is, is adjusting, Portugal is adjusting. So, you know, it's, it's taking place, but it's taking place in a slow way and in a partial way. Uh, and this is something that was not sufficiently present at the start was not sufficiently addressed in the reforms, and you mentioned the excessive imbalance uh, procedure, it's not implemented. Pardon? It's not implemented. Germany has had... Uh, no. se it's eight, asymmetrically nine, implemented. Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be implemented. Right, right. Um, you know, it was supposed to be symmetric. It was never, the, the, the procedure was never activated. So the macro side remains neglected. So, uh, I think that's, uh, that's one point on which you, you, you agree. Now, one of the recommendations of Olivier is say, we can do better by having a higher inflation rate, so achieving 2% really, uh, and that means in, in this current situation, taking the risk of being a little bit above 2%, you know, uh, but the, the risk of having too low inflation is very detrimental to your area, yeah? that's what you're saying. Um, and second, that means you know, all this uh, much more uh, institutional approach to uh, the wage price setting and the social partners that you mentioned. Can, can I have uh, some reaction from, from you on this uh, topic? Yeah, I, I can give you very quick reactions. Number one, inflation is stuck at 1%. In, in Italy, it is about 0.6%. And we're talking about higher inflation in Germany the ECB has essentially lost credibility as an inflation fighting machine. And therefore, there's been a, a disengagement between price setting behavior and monetary policy. This is like the Bank of Japan. Essentially, you have the same problem here. The Bank of Japan keeps trying to uh, introduce a same stimulative monetary policy. Inflation does not budge because the relationship between how people set prices and how inflation is get, gets and how what the monetary policy does, there is no connection. On on adjustment through wages, the the main problem through adjustment through wages is social. You know, in my book, I tell a story about a, a woman who is a worker in a factory in 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 Ivrea. And her, her, her income has gone down from 1,000 euros a month to 600 euros a month. And she says, if you cut it anymore, I won't be able to pay my mortgage. And the, the, this, the social cost, the social discontent that is created through this process is enormous. That is why people have floating exchange rates. The, the, world, the rest of the world has floating exchange rates for a very good reason. Uh, because it is, creates a, an easy adjustment process. The adjustment through wages is almost never possible. Therefore, the idea, and this, you know, coming back to a statement that, Olivia, you made, that a, a floating exchange rate was a non-starter. I mean, it's, it's a non-starter today, I understand that, but was a non-starter. I, I don't buy that. I simply don't buy that. Uh, between, and, and Jean-Claude will remember this, uh, from the time of the breakdown of the ERM to the time of uh, the introduction of the euro was a period of seven years. Essentially, uh, exchange rates were in effect floating. He was making sure that the exchange rate remained close to what, what, that, what it was for Germany, but that was a policy choice. There was no commitment. And that's the crucial point about fixed exchange rate. There was no commitment to a fixed exchange rate, which allows the possibility that if there is a crisis, there will be an adjustment through the exchange rate. That, that possibility was essentially removed. And if that possibility is removed, adjustment through wages is never going to happen. So, Claude, uh, particularly on this uh, issue also of the, um, of the inflationary machine, as uh, 
I shall question about the, the ECB, the possibility of generating inflation on yeah. target. Well, as you know, it's a problem for all uh, major central banks of, uh, of the advanced economy. So we, I, I will go there. First of all, I would like to go to the point which was made by uh, Olivier. It is absolutely clear that rules were not respected. My first speech, myself, just appointed president of the ECB, was to tell Germany and France in the European Parliament, by the way, under the presidency of Italy, that it was a pity to refuse that the Stability and Growth Pact rules would be applied to Germany and France. Jacques Chirac and uh, Chancellor Schroeder were on the same line. And of course, they were backed by Italy. It's been a pity, not especially for Germany, probably for France, and of course for Greece and for Portugal and for uh, Spain in some respect, that uh, considered that the Stability and Growth Pact had not necessarily to be respected. A second experience I could mention was that since 2005, looking at the persistent divergences that we were observing in cost competitiveness and external imbalances, I was circulating every month to all ministers of finance of the euro area the divergences that were going on the and famous on and graphs. on since the start of the euro until 2009, namely after the financial crisis. The only way to block that phenomenon had been uh, objectively the financial crisis. They were all aware of that. They were all aware of, of the fact that it was possible in this currency area to have the wages and salaries in the public sector in Greece to augment by 117% from the beginning up to end of nine, when it was 110 but in Ireland, 70% in Portugal, and 36 in the average of the euro area, when it was 20 in Germany. So the possibility... Dr. Dr. In aren't, a, you, aren't you lending support to, the, to a shock? Of course. Uh, I, by, by I, saying, I, I you clearly know, all said... The pressure, it was all the clear, pressure on the ministers was... It was, was clear was, since 2005 that we needed a very strong governance at the level of the center in order to do what Olivier was calling for, which has been done in the heat of the crisis with the obligation for a number of countries to go back to something which was more normal. And they are all, by the way, in current account surplus now, and an enormous, uh, I would say, hard way. But how could it be anything but hard when you have distributed currencies in the same, uh, you know, euro area currency that is uh, an international currency of great value by 117% in Greece, it was obvious that the adjustment would be very, very painful. But all that being said, we are supposed now to be in a different world. And I fully agree with Olivier that the macroeconomic imbalance procedure has to be applied symmetrically. And of course, uh, maybe uh, a number of observers were too optimistic in thinking that Germany in a overheating situation would go back to the average yearly inflation that it had observed in the past. Before the euro, 40 years before the euro, Germany had a yearly inflation of 2.93%. It is what we need now, clearly. If we want the 2% to be respected at the level of the euro area as a whole, we need a number of countries. The cases in point are clearly Germany and the Netherlands, a little bit perhaps Austria, and others below the average in order to catch up with their last competitive cost competitiveness inside the setup of the euro area. So, but, but let's not forget, the MIP has been created. So the criticism is that it is not applied as it should, and I fully agree with Olivier, uh, but uh, let's, let's not say that we did nothing in the circumstances. And I was calling for that, you know, since the very uh, first observation that there was no spontaneous correction of these persistent uh, divergences. You should save a little bit of time to speak of yeah. Italy. Of course. Uh, uh, yeah. Italy, okay. if you... I thought Ashok said something very unfair. And I think Jean-Claude is not in a position to actually con uh, contradict him. He said the ECB has lost all credibility no. because inflation is less than 2%. We understand the problems of central banks. The ECB is not the only central bank to have been unable to increase demand sufficiently to achieve inflation, has done more or less everything it could. That was just not enough. 
The same thing has been true in the US. It has taken a long time to get back to 2%. So the notion that the ECB has lost credibility. No, I'm happy to say this because I've criticized the ECB enough in the past yeah. to have credibility. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you should not say things like there's that. There's a huge difference between the Fed and the ECB. I appreciate very much what you said. By the way, since the very beginning, we delivered 1.75%. For a central bank who said at the very beginning it will be less than two but close to two, it's not that bad uh, over yeah, I'm not being, 20 years. I'm not speaking of your phase, uh, Jean-Claude. I'm speaking of today. Today, the, the inflation rate is stuck at 1%. The, no. The no. U.S. interest, uh, sorry, inflation rate is stuck at 1%. The Fed is at 2% and rising. The ECB is 1% and not rising. Ashoka, there, there is some kind of consensus now, including the IMF, that we are not absurd in uh, projecting 1.7 for next year and 1.7 for the year afterwards, which is more or less in line with... It's been predicted for the last five years. Yeah, I mean, okay. of course. But we were in can the we, worst crisis we, ever since World War II. That? And uh, it started in Wall Street. So to put the blame on the euro area is a little bit overdone. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Olivier, you also uh, you, you recently published a piece on, on Italy, uh, giving your assessment of the fiscal policy of the current coalition. Uh, so that would be a good uh, point to start with. I mean, give us your, your take. So I'll, I'll make two points. Uh, the first one is this piece that you referred to, which came out yesterday, which argues that the fiscal expansion that Italy is embarking on may actually not affect growth positively at all. The reason is, when you have a fiscal expansion, uh, you're going to get an increase in interest rates. In normal countries, the central bank is going to react. But when you are in a country where the investors, the foreign investors, the domestic investors are on the edge, what you're going to get is a spread. And basically, the increase in the spread that the government and the budget has created, which is about 300, uh, 250 points, uh, is probably sufficient to offset any direct effect. So my sense is that the forecasts of growth for Italy are wrong, and this has implications, because if they don't deliver on growth and they have a larger deficit in the end, then things will look bad. Now, the other point that I want to make is that there's a more fundamental point, which is, it's a point I made yesterday briefly, but I'll, I'll make it again, which is, if you have, in any of the Euro countries, a populist government which is not willing to play by the fiscal rules at all, so which appears to be fiscally responsible or makes noises about maybe there's a plan B if we get out of the euro. It is a recipe for foreign investors to take their money, move out, for domestic investors to take their money, move out. What is the amount of money which can in principle move just from the foreign investors? It's more than two trillion. There is absolutely no way anybody can stand in the way of a stampede, in which case in this case, the banks have to close, there's a banking holiday, and they have to reopen with a lira. And that scenario, I think, unfortunately, has positive probability. And I think it's going to be an existential issue for the euro, because the probability that there is a populist government somewhere in the euro in the next 10 years uh, is fairly high. And that tension is going to be there. It's very hard to, uh, to see how it gets resolved. The euro is incompatible with at least some forms of populism. I would add just one caveat to what you just said, because you sort of can be understood as saying we have no instrument. There is an instrument at the, the OMT of the ECB, but no it supposes that there is a program uh, of uh, a policy program that's agreed uh, upon between the, the ESM and the government, which is obviously the solution to the political equations you're, no, if, you're if putting. We, if we see a pass again, which is you know, somebody changing his mind, realizing that the environment is not very nice, then the crisis can be solved. But if the government insists no, on no. keeping the same line, there is no OMT, there is no yeah, program, we, we agree on that. and it doesn't happen. Reactions to this, this point? Yeah, Jean-Claude? Yeah, uh, well, uh, again, I think that any time we have a problem, we are back to the existential problem of the euro, of the euro area. I think it's wrong. And I think that uh, we proved uh, over the last 20 years that uh, this permanent assumption that we are on the verge to catastrophe is not right. We had the stress test, we passed the stress test. The situation of Italy today is much, much better, obviously, than the situation of Greece. And even in Greece, the people didn't want to leave. 
uh, as I already mentioned, the Italian people doesn't want to leave. The, the Prime Minister, the President of the Council of Ministers in Italy, and the two leaders of the two other parties had said publicly, we don't want to leave the EU, we don't want to leave the European Union. So I think it's a, there is a triangle, the market, investors and savers the world over, and nationally, of course, the government, and the promise they made, and the, the commission, and the partners. The commission is uh, simplification for all the other partners in Europe. And my, my bet, which uh, I'm very confident on the result, would be that a, a solution would be find out. And of course, the, the markets, if there is the confirmation that uh, Italy doesn't want to do anything that would re-establish credit worthiness, I experienced that myself in August 11. And it was so dramatic that uh, we intervened overnight on the market, massively. It was the SMP program. We didn't let the speculation to explode. I wrote a letter to Berlusconi in explaining Berlusconi that in my mind and the mind of, uh, of Mario, because the, there was the double signature of the ECB and of the national governor, we thought the situation was so dramatic that the government had to give a number of uh, new signals to the overall investors and savers the world over. And it was done. And of course, there were changes of government and so forth. So I, I am absolutely confident on the fact that we will surmount the difficulty. The political difficulty, I fully agree, is extremely worrying, not only for Italy, but for others. Because when extreme left and extreme right are uniting, it is uh, you know, the worst possible political situation you can have. We have the, we had the experience of the 30s uh, and uh, of uh, between the two world wars. So, so I, I take very very seriously the political aspect. I would not say that it means that the euro area will explode. No, I, I, okay, I want let to be me clear that I, I'm not saying it will happen. Hmm. Uh, I'm on the same side as you. If I had to take a bet, I would bet yeah. against. But I think the probability is sufficiently high that we have to think about it. Yeah.